Welcome to the Queer Spirit Podcast. I'm your host, Nick Venagoni. Here we have conversations with artists, healers, and activists who enliven the LGBTQ communities and who empower our queer spirits to flourish. Before we start the interview, I'd like to offer you a gift. I work with many queer folks who struggle with self-esteem, self-acceptance, and confidence. And I get it. Growing up queer is no cakewalk. Living in a world filled with homophobia and oppression can take its toll. Having the strength to be true to yourself can be a challenge, but you can change that. So if you'd like support taking the first few steps, head over to my website and grab your free copy of The Self-Confident Queer. Just go to queerhealingjourneys.com forward slash confident. This guide will walk you through three simple steps to help you begin to build your self-worth and confidence today. So head over to queerhealingjourneys.com forward slash confident and download your free guide today. Okay, now on with the show. My guests today are Claudio Opera and Maria Fernandez. Claudio is a queer permaculture educator, artist, and healer. Since the pandemic, he has set up the Sanctuary Goa, an experimental arts and permaculture sanctuary that explores the intersection between permaculture and queerness, as well as the question of where our healing may come from. Maria is a body-based facilitator and therapist, merging yoga and expressive arts therapy, as well as social permaculture. Today we discuss how the principles of permaculture to live in harmony with the natural world help us create and foster queer community. Claudio and Maria share their ideas about how nature is inherently queer. We also discuss their vision for the Sanctuary Goa as a center of art and healing for queer folks in that region of India. For more information about this project, visit The Sanctuary Goa on Instagram. That's T-H-E-S-A-N-Q-T-U-A-R-Y-G-O-A. All right. Hello, Maria and Claudio. Welcome to the show. Hi, Nick. Hi. Thank you. So since we have two people on the show today, I wonder if you could just take a moment and introduce yourself to our listeners so they can hear your voice. Sure. My name is Claudio Obra. I'm a Romanian-born queer permaculturist and artist settled in Goa in India now for uh, the last few years. Um, the founder of the Sanctuary Goa, safe space for the queer community to engage and uh, explore the intersection of permaculture arts and embodied practice to help assist healing. Yeah. Hi, I'm Maria and I'm from India, currently living in Goa at the Sanctuary. And I'm a body-based therapist, which comes from my training as a yoga therapist, as well as as an expressive arts therapist, and my engagement with social permaculture. And so this all comes together as a way for us to connect better with our bodies, to have a more intimate uh, connection with our bodies, so that they can be a home for us that feels safe and pleasurable. Great. Thank you. So can you tell us a little bit about what the sanctuary is and how it came to be? So the sanctuary is a response, I guess, to the needs that we have as people in the world, irrespective of our sexual orientation, our gender. Sanctuary, the idea came many, many years ago when I was researching different communities around the world. I came across the Radical Fairies as sort of the first model, if you wish, of of an actual space where queer people can live in deep connection to nature and off the grid and off the land and immerse in a healing journey that's held. And so that was the first kind of idea that <clears throat> sprung into my mind or you know exceeded this desire to create something like that in Romania on my land because also the situation in Romania for queers is not so good so whilst I was visiting back going from India to Romania I saw that the people my queer friends in Bucharest were also involved in organizing any queer events and queer pride they're just burnt out exhausted unsafe 
and I wanted to open up my space for them to just have a sanctuary so at least they can plan for these events in nature in a safe space and there's good food around and there's beautiful walks and river and all that so that we can drift out of our heads I just saw people burnt out by being so much in their heads and then I was uh, lucky enough to be part of a transient sanctuary in the UK that was uh, being organized at festivals by my dear friend Camille Barton. And yeah, that was a safe space for queer people of color with workshops, with events, with it was an experiment with deep learning. But to me, it was like, what are we actually needing as a community? What are the very basic and important things that we need? to allow ourselves to be in our fullness, to exist in our fullness. And yeah, so the creation of a physical space, very, very important. Uh, And that's how it all came about. And then lockdown happened, Corona happened, and I chose to stay in Goa. And I was teaching permaculture at a school, at an international school. I was working with kids aged 1 to 12. And, and yeah, that sort of ended abruptly. And then I was like, right, I'm here and I'm needing my community. I would normally leave, go to Europe, spend my time with my queers in the fields around the country. And again, be part of creating these temporary settlements at festivals, you know, where everyone comes together, works really, really hard and creates a magical experience. But it's a testament of what we can do together when we're wanting to create something that's bigger than uh, the sum of our parts. So yeah, that was kind of it. And then um, this magical, crazy, beautiful space manifested here in Goa. We're in a 120 year old Portuguese home surrounded by ancient mango trees and jackfruit trees and coconuts. And we're also planting edible forest here and we're working with the land and yeah regenerating it because it needed a lot of love so I think that we're focusing on we've been focused on until now and langurs and oh yeah and the wildlife and, and, yeah we've got cobras and all sorts <laughs> yeah it's a trip now for our listeners who may not know what permaculture is can you give us a little bit of an idea of what that is because I know that's a big part of what you are doing there <laughs> yes i part of permaculture ethics is fair share so i feel like i've spoken uh, quite a bit until now so i'm gonna pass in the spirit of permaculture fair shares to maria but then i will come back and give my uh, understanding of it. yes and for our listeners who can't see you guys they are maria and cloud you are both cozy next to each other in a very warm climate right now so they're both in the same space (laughs) thank you yeah thanks Nick so I think yeah permaculture is quite a wide term that encompasses many things and so I can speak a little bit about what it is for me because different people I speak to have a different relationship with permaculture or how it kind of relates to their life. Um, So for me, in my experience, permaculture, I would say like as a definition is a a design, sort of an approach to designing living systems so as to create a system that is regenerative, not just sustainable, but regenerative. And it came out of the land. So it came, it was short for permanent agriculture. And then also kind of came to be associated with, I mean, with people as well and people systems. Uh, And then so it became short for permanent culture. And as Claudio mentioned, uh, one of the ethics already uh, of Fair Shares, there's three main ethics of care for the earth, care for people and fair share of future care. And it's for me, it's really also about understanding the patterns and within nature, understanding how nature functions, us humans being a part of nature. So not that we are separate from it, but understanding these flows and then Using specific tools and also based on the principles of permaculture, there's a, there's a whole list of principles. I guess what Maria, if I may, what Maria was referring to, the least amount of intervention. So by observing the system, uh, seeing how it behaves and doing the least amount of change with the least amount of you know, effort to enable better flows and better relationships, better communication, better interaction, better integration. If I may share what I 
detail permaculture m- means to me. I've sort of sat with this both in my head, in my mind, and in my body, and in my hands, and you know, in any way that I could. What is permaculture actually? Because and there isn't a fixed point to it. And there are as many definitions as there are practitioners. But for me, the simplified version that actually made sense to me was care, care, like care and love. Like, how do I care for myself? How do I care for others? How do I care for my immediate environment? How do I care for, you know, someone from Nepal that I don't even know who they are? How do I demonstrate that care? How do I care for the future? What do I do now? that will potentially have positive ripples. And so I had to also simplify and go, what can I do? Because I'm not superhuman, even though I may have, you know, delusions of grandeur thinking that I am, but what can I be doing today to, you know, hint that that could happen in the future? I'm going to be planting a tree today that does not guarantee that that tree is going to be staying alive for two, three hundred years producing fruit. But that tree has the inherent ability and drive and will to be alive for that long. It will withstand whatever the environment has to throw at it and adapt. And so for me, that's great deep learning. We're surrounded by ancient trees here at the sanctuary. They're over 100 years old. Imagine the stories, imagine the monsoons that they've gone through, that they've been carved by, that they've been you know, shaped by. And here they are giving us shade. Without them, we will be dead. So, you know, it sort of unfolds like that for me. What are the actions that I can take right now, as just anyone can, to, you know, reflect that we are thinking of the future. We are thinking of the kids that we don't know that haven't been born yet that will be brought into this world. And what are we leaving for them? How do we want this planet to, you know, will it even be able to support to sustain them? So, yeah, we're going to keep trying to do that on a micro level and on a macro level. So that the beauty of permaculture is that you can zoom in and design a pond that's one meter by one meter. And then you can go and design a food forest that's hundreds of square kilometers. So it's like its scope, it's limitless. And for me, the passion about permaculture has been the land because you know it's the sort of the source of permaculture observing the land has informed this philosophy and for me it's about the invisible structures is the stuff that we don't see is the social side is the relationships is the stuff that we don't uh, that's not visible that makes everything else visible and these are the things that i'm really passionate about and learning about and exploring in this space that we've created in the way we live our lives well i think that may tie into my next question, which is, you know, you've talked about how at the sanctuary, you're trying to weave together queerness and permaculture. So how do you see that coming together? I mean, I hear that a little bit in your last statement about the invisible and the visible, but I'm curious to hear what else you have to share about that and how you do that at the sanctuary. Sure. Well, something Claudio has said before, which I really like, is that nature is queer. And so in some ways, these things are already like queerness and permaculture are already closely tied together. It's more a matter of us just opening up ourselves to it. You know, if we just open and connect it to these things, to nature, to ourselves, to each other more, then we'd just be able to see how this diversity that also for me, queerness is about. It's about the celebration of diversity which is evident in nature, in the ways in which forests function, the ways in which, you know, these climates and biodiverse climates are created with different trees and plants and microorganisms living together in, with also very specific relationships in the way in which they give and take, they care for each other, they support each other. So for me, that's, I'd say that's how it. Absolutely. So nature is unfiltered. It's uh, responding to its stimuli. It's playful. It's yeah, kind of all of the things that we as humans kind of drift away from, especially in cities. Like we lose our ferality. We lose our kind of like animal instinct. You know, we lose that kind of how do we even engage with nature? Like we don't know how to walk in a forest you know we go and put rubber soles on our feet and like another two three inches of separation between our feet and the skin of the earth and so 
it's about kind of going back to what is real, to what is important and to what is healing, you know, to what makes us feel good. Like, not because our heads are telling us this, it's because our bodies, our spirits, we just feel energized in ways in which we can't describe, you know, and we feel energized. For me personally, I feel most energized when I am in connection to these living entities around me with like awake, aware connection. I'm present there and all I need to be is just barefoot outside and everything that I need to know, I'll be guided. All I need to do is just look around and see how my plants are doing and they'll tell me what they're needing. You know, all I got to do is just stay still and not think, you know, just allow for this other intelligence to guide. And I feel that this is kind of queer in the way, I mean, queerness for me goes beyond sexuality, obviously, but it's like, it's just a way of being that's emergent, that's intuitive, that's connected. And then we're able to respond from that place of, you know, awareness and again, not too much mind stuff, but what can I do right now to make this better? Not just for me, but for everything around me. And more specifically at the sanctuary, how we've been sort of doing this is, is one is to our own approach of even setting up this place, you know, procuring materials that are local, uh, reusing old furniture, repairing them, recycling, and also creating a space. So we've had workshops for this whole series uh, called Into the Body and Into the Land, you know, for, for people to come to help connect. Uh, better to our bodies, uh, to the land around us, to each other. Uh, so, just, so just opening up this space for others, since, since that connection is primal, that connection is so important, that's been the early stages of our work, is, is having this space for people to come and, and engage in these ways of connecting to the materiality as well of our bodies and of nature around us. And to also witness what can be done in a household, you know, like recycling all our water, which is in a place like Goa, there's three meters of rainfall every year and there's a drought for six months a year. So it doesn't make sense that there's water shortages. So we're working on solutions around how to store more water, more rainwater, how to preserve the water, how to reuse the water. So these are systems that we built around we're working with living biology. So we're working with a lot of plants that are also our medicine, our food. So, you know, just creating these closed loop systems on our land that people can be part of building them as we're doing them. We invite support to sometimes organize perma blitzes or short courses where we focus on a particular design that we want to implement and add on. And then people can participate in that way. We're also exploring and looking at how to expand this online because uh, it feels like there's a lot of people could benefit more from what we're doing. And yeah, I think the latest addition is a spa that we've created in our back garden, which again is to have a beautiful, safe space surrounded by plant life and animal life where we can allow ourselves to let go and rest and just be and work with our bodies wherever they're at, work with our minds, work with our energy fields, just, uh, yeah. So that's been our, we're also all body workers or therapists, so it's in line with what we're doing. Great. So it sounds like you have a lot of things happening there. You have the spa, you have the land, you have mm. these workshops and classes. Is there anything else that you are offering or envisioning that you know, what maybe a guest to the sanctuary might encounter? Sure. So we're also kind of dabbling in creating culture, queer culture here. So we're, we're kind of like purveyors of queer culture and we love to celebrate. I think, you know, celebration is part of, really important part of queerness, but also celebrate with awareness by honoring our ancestors, by knowing the struggles of the people before us that enabled us to live the way in which we do today. So it's a celebration and an opportunity to educate ourselves, an opportunity to come together in new ways. Uh, so we've created, a, we've curated a queer ball here in Goa that happened uh, last month, which was an amazing event because it brought together people that were in separate corners. And for the first time, uh, for some, there was an opportunity to be in the same space, enjoying themselves and learning about each other, kind of being open in a new way. So that sort of segregation is still very much 
prominent. The, in, in, in India, you have caste system, you have class, caste, you have so many more layers of bullshit and separation. And so I'm learning a lot. And, you know, I have a lot of work to do. But for me, it's about what I want to bring at the sanctuary is a safe space for locals primarily. And it's very difficult to reach the non-privileged you know, Indian kids that don't know that this could exist, you know, a space like this could exist. And, you know, a space of education where we learn about safe sexual practices, safer sexual practices. You know, it's very difficult to even get tested here. So there isn't a place that offers all the tests in one go. And it's so expensive that no one can afford to do it. So even my local friends are not able or have never been tested for any STIs in their late 20s, very active sexually. And it's, to me, that's a little bit scary. You know, that's a little bit scary in the sense that what's going to happen in the next five years, if this is the behavior now and the severe lack of support, and what will that translate into in terms of, yeah, our health as a community? So this is what I'm passionate about and this is what I'm going to be focusing on and I need support with. And it's a long process. Also, I don't want to start something as a fad. I want to start something and make sure that it's sustained to make sure that it serves people and it starts slow and it builds up like any grassroots movement to build that trust in a community. You know, it takes time and you've got to be consistently showing up. So that's the journey that we're, we're on now. Yeah. Yeah, you want it to be a, a strong 500-year-old tree, like you talked about, you know, the tree that gives for many generations, not just in your lifetime. Yeah, exactly. So who is the sanctuary for right now? Is it for locals? Is it for visitors? Is it for anyone? Like, who who are you wanting? I mean, as I imagine that's probably a little, you know, mysterious in our current climate with COVID and everything right now. But you know, ultimately, who is it really for? Well, it's for, it's for queer people and others. And it, there's different levels of engagement. So there's some of us who are here, staying here, you know, working from here, uh, offering workshops. There are people who have, so, you know, Goa is also quite interesting in many ways. So there's local people from here and there's many people from other parts of India who have moved to Goa as well. And some come for shorter periods. So, yeah, I would say it's, yeah, for different people and different levels of engagement that they can, you know, that they're available to in that moment. So we had people come from, yeah, various places of the country for various reasons. And I guess the whole point of us existing is to be present and to see how we can be there for people in a non-scripted way and just genuinely help and be there for them, whether they need to talk, to be listened to, whether they need support in, in bigger ways. We'd like to be that, you know, like important place in someone's journey that can guide them and hold them in whatever way they need to be held and guided. And what's emerged for us is like, we need to create the support systems for us first to be able to sustain this. Because we, and to also allow for the emergence, you know? So it's like, we're figuring out a structure to... You know, to go, are we replenished? Are we full? Can we, you know, are we have the carrying capacity for this? And if we don't, what are the support systems in place to do this properly? And when we're not here, can the place sustain itself, which is what we're wanting. I'm from Romania. I'll never be fully integrated here. This place is for Indians, primarily. It exists here for a reason. So it's hoping that it won't be depending on our physical presence being here, that we can support local um, queers to set up enterprises from here, small micro businesses. We're setting up a plant nursery as well and training some locals to work with us and learn our queer ways of doing things and working with the plants. So yeah, that's kind of the vision on uh, you know, a longer term vision. And we're wanting to learn and play and keep it because like I know that I'm very driven and like sometimes I get, you know, too focused and um, go as in India is teaching me that no, nothing works at your speed mm -hmm. or nothing works in the ways in which you with your European mind are, you know, expecting of. So, yeah, it's very good for me to be here personally. Well, I think that's also a very kind of 
permaculture kind of concept of like nature, you know, is not always going to do what you want it to do. It's going to do what it needs to do. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So as we start to wrap up a little bit, I wonder if each of you could take a moment to share with us a person, practice, or experience that has supported your queer spirit to flourish. I would like to share about the somatic practice, actually, that I have currently been studying with uh, Navde Johar, who is uh, both a, a yoga teacher a proponent as well as a Bharatnatyam dancer. And also uh, was one of the main petitioners for Section 377 being in India, which was the anti-homosexuality uh, law. And so in his, it's called Abhya Somatics. And the, the somatic practice very much also takes these lineages of yoga as well as Indian poetics and Indian dance. And it's a space to um, enter the body, to look at the desire within the body, within matter, the restlessness within matter and its desires and to listen to it and allow for it without the constraints of ideas that our mind often puts on us. And it has really helped me develop a more poetic relationship with my body, to see the poetry of my body, to own the desires of my body and uh, to really enjoy my body, to, you know, and enjoy it as a place of both, like I said before, like pleasure and safety as a home that's safe and pleasurable. So yeah, that practice has definitely, I would say, um, opened me up to my queerness more because it's a practice that opens one up. Yeah, that's what I would like to say. For me, it was also a person who's inspired me to have a different connection with my body and his name is Tim Mushroom. He's a radical fairy. We met in Brighton in the UK a few years ago. We had a very few encounters that were very meaningful and for me, uh, redefined my connection to my body, how I want to be touched, how I want to touch others. Yeah, it just allowed me to explore connection in more meaningful ways. So yeah, gratitude to Mushroom. <laughs> So where can people find you and learn more about the sanctuary and what kind of work you're doing? So we have an Instagram page, the Sanctuary Goa, that's pretty active. Uh, the Sanctuary with a Q. So S-A-N-Q-T-U-A-R-Y, the Sanctuary Goa. And yeah, our personal pages, Maria is a multiplicity of moves. So Maria Fernandez on Instagram. I'm Claude Opera on Instagram. We are in Goa for another week or just under a week. We're both traveling in different directions. Uh, we're going to the mountains. It gets quite hot at this time of year in Goa. And as I said, we're getting to the end of our two brain cell processing capacity. So um, yeah, we'll be going to the hills, but we'll be returning in June in monsoon, hopefully with an artist residency. We're trying to see if we can create this, if we can make this happen. We're wanting to bring some wonderful young queer Dalit artists that we met. And yeah, but that's sort of in the pipeline. But we'll be away for the next six weeks to the mountains, to Maria's. I'm going to tell you her journey. Well, also to say that right now our spa is open. And so even though uh, Claudia and I are away, Rufus, who is one of our in-house uh, body-based therapists, will continue uh, to run the spa yeah. during this period as well. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much both for being here on this hot day for you in the middle of your summer, or I guess it's almost the end of your summer, isn't it? Uh, so. it's mid I'm getting into <laughs> it, like peak of it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Got it. Yeah. Well, thank you again for being here and sharing about the sanctuary. And I will also have those links in the show notes so people can easily find them and connect with you there. Wonderful. Thank, thank you, you so Nick. much, Nick. To find the resources we discussed today, find the show notes at thequeerspirit.com. And if you enjoyed the show, remember to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. This will help us reach and support more queer people all over. Thanks for listening and see you next time. 